Today on World Denver Talks, we're glad to have as our guest Mr. Oliver Dowden, who is a top advisor to the British Prime Minister David Cameron. Oliver Dowden studied law at Cambridge University. He entered politics in about 2004 and uh, became deputy campaigns director for the Conservative Party. Then in 2007, for a year or so, he went for a stint at the international public relations firm Hill & Knowlton and returned and now is political advisor to uh, Mr. David Cameron. And I wonder what that means in a, in a typical day, a typical week. I, I envision you um, getting up every day to see every newspaper and see what's happening. Yes, I mean, it's a, it is a bit like that. And I suppose it's worth sort of taking a step back and looking at how Downing Street is structured because it sort of influences what my job is. Yes, so uh, David Cameron is the head of the UK government, distinguishing from the Queen. The Queen is the head of state. She's the, the sort of the, the figurehead of the nation. David Cameron is the head of government, so his role um, is to be in charge of, of the government. So it, all, all government policy goes through him. And in order to do that, he needs a, a number of different advisors. He needs um, the civil servants, so those are government employees, who actually make things happen. They, they are the people that actually deliver the business of government on a day-to-day -day basis. And on the top of that, he has a team of political advisers, and I sit in his political office, and the role of his political office is to advise the Prime Minister in his capacity as leader of the Conservative Party. So looking at everything the government is doing and looking at the impact on, on the Conservative Party and on, on David Cameron as leader of the Conservative Party. So what that typically breaks down to into is most of my time is spent uh, with day-to-day -day crisis management. It's the sort of term we use, we're not permanently in crisis, but dealing with all the issues that, um, that arise on a day-to-day -day basis. So depending on how political the topic is, I will, I will have an impact as a, or an input as an advisor to him. And in addition to that, I work on messages and lines to take. So that's to say you know, what people um, say when they're on the media. Not, not sort of dictating <laughs> terms of what they say, but, but they're sort of in informing them of, of what the general position of the Conservative Party is. And then the, the final element of it is the press and research department of the Conservative Party report through to me into the Prime Minister. Of course, the, the first thing I do in the morning, well, if I'm not woken up by my, my very young children, I turn on the Today programme, hear what's going on. Hopefully, we'll have some sense of what's coming up anyway, but, uh, but often you'll, you'll get surprised by what's going on. It, it's working out with our media team how you respond to that. That's what I was going to ask. Do you, do you anticipate what's coming, or when was the last time you were surprised? Uh, I'm surprised on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's no accounting for the conduct of, of individuals, but we had the expenses scandal in the UK. So this was, um, what happened was we, um, previous government, Tony Blair's government, introduced a Freedom of Information Act, which meant that public could request pieces of government information and could be put into the public domain. So one of the pieces of information that was requested was the um, expenses of all members of parliament. And when people saw some of these expenses, they were quite surprised. And there was a huge amount of public um, outrage at the sort of expense claims that were being made for, by members of parliament. And it did such extent that some of these MPs were prosecuted and, and sent to prison eventually. So this was a sort of watershed moment in British politics. So what, what we worked on was how the Conservative Party would respond to it. So um, the Prime Minister chose to set up um, a, an internal review within the Conservative Party whereby a group of officials, including myself, looked through all of the expenses of MPs and we determined whether they should make payments back to, um, back to the government or back to the, the Exchequer. Out of that, you, you get a sense of the, the job involves sort of help, um, finding out what's going on politically for the Prime Minister and then um, working with him as an advisor on, on how you respond to it um, politically. A another example of something that, that took um, a, a huge amount of time up you, you may know there was um, the scandal Social over media uh, phone hacking um, and as a result of that the Prime Minister set up an inquiry into to media ethics led by, by Lord Justice Leveson um, and obviously this was a, a very big event and we had to pre prepare the Prime Minister for that so that took a, an awful lot of time in terms of making sure we, he had the full facts on, on everything that was going on. Is that still choppy water for him? Can that still come back to be a problem for him? There's two separate processes. So there is the um, there's there's the sort of public policy direction, which is being led by Lord Justice Leveson. But obviously, in, in England, as in or in the United Kingdom, as in the United States, there is a completely separate process, which is the process that the um, that the police have to take, and that 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 is being left to 
obviously they, they need to pursue their own course. I think Lord Justice Leveson is due to report in the autumn and then obviously it will be for the Prime Minister and the, the government to consider how to, to respond to this. But he's absolutely clear that we, the sort of things that had happened in the past shouldn't be allowed to happen again. And this was, this was the whole purpose of setting up the Leveson inquiry in the first place. Would the Prime Minister attempt to put some sort of structure on the media? Well, I think we have to wait to see what, what, what Lord Justice Leveson says. I mean, I think, uh, I think he said in the evidence that he gave, his preference would be for some form of um, self-regulation. Obviously, the, there's a, a difficult balance to be struck between um, having, uh, uh, making sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again, but at the same time defending press freedom. And press freedom is absolutely vital, as much as we... Uh, we suffer at the hands of our aggressive press, which is I think, even more aggressive than the press here. That is a vital part of, of, of our freedom and it's a vital part of our democratic process. So he's absolutely keen to make sure that we do, don't do anything that impinges on that freedom, whilst at the same time um, making sure that what happened in the past isn't allowed to happen again. So I think that's, that's why he's asked somebody independent and very well respected in the form of Lord Leveson to, to look into that and to, to come up with the conclusions. And, We'll, we'll wait and see what he comes up with. You mentioned the riots yes. uh, of last summer, yeah. in summer of 2011. Was that a surprise, the way that developed and became as big as it did uh, among yes. British youth? Yes, I think it, it was a surprise, the, the, the scale and the, 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 the speed with which it grew. I think the, the good thing, well, the good things that emerged from it was that, first of all, the authorities were able to deal with it relatively quickly, so it didn't, didn't spiral and luckily hasn't recurred, but also, I think uh, the, in the response to it, the British people showed a you know, tremendous amount of um, uh, can-do spirit. There was this famous um, <laughs> the brooms uh, incident whereby by the residents of Clapham, who'd had some of their shops um, destroyed and looted, they, the, they all emerged with their brooms and sort of swept, swept up the, <laughs> the remains. That does lead you to the, to the next um, concern, which is that unemployment among young, mm. young people, mm. as it is here, is, mm. is much higher um, among young people than it is adults. Uh, how has the Prime Minister addressed that? Sadly, we've had a problem with youth unemployment in the United Kingdom for a, a very long time under both the last government and, and, and this government. And there's a particular problem. It's not just the direct numbers of, of unemployed um, young people. It's people who are indirectly unemployed, so what we call a not in uh, education employment or training. So even if they're not actually claiming the dole, they, um, they are still, uh, they're still not actually actively working. So what we've tried to do is, is introduce a, a, a radical new approach of, of, of welfare to work scheme, the biggest welfare to work scheme that's been in, in this country for, for at least 50 years, possibly since the 1930s. And the idea of that is actually to shift to a payment by results system. So you say there is a large cost for a young person to be unemployed. Um, so if a company can actually get that person into employment, they'll be able to, to get that money and create a strong incentive for, for them to, to find work placements for people. Um, so in, instead of it just being the government that finds the jobs, the government says there is this, this pot of money and uh, a range of organisations, whether it's private sector or whether it's charities, uh, the intention is that they should, they should come forward with schemes that get young people into work. And did the Olympics help with, with unemployment? Uh, first of all, there's the temporary employment that you get, get from the Olympics, which is obviously a, a good boost. But also there was a fantastic voluntary movement with the Olympics. Um, anyone that went to Olympic Games would have seen there were volunteers everywhere. And uh, I think about 70,000 volunteers signed up to participate in the, um, the Olympic Games. And they really helped make the Olympic Games a fantastic experience. Um, and I think, the, first of all, there's the sort of experience people gained from that, but also there's a hope that we can sort of capture that spirit of, of civil engagement and volunteering and uh, that it will continue because I think it's one of the sad things that the decline in participation in, in sort of voluntary organisations in, in this country and I think in the United States as well. So hopefully there's a, we, that, that marks a sort of change in, in, in attitudes towards volunteering.